So we've got three quarters of an hour and um, basically welcome everybody. Um, my name is Tracy Lazard, I'm the CEO of Inclusion London and we've been um, involved in a lot of current and um, past campaigning including the in Save the Independent Living Fund. Uh, we work really closely with lots of you here and, and Brian. Um, the purpose of this workshop is really, I guess, to kind of quickly give an overview of the kind of campaigning, the things we've learned in the campaigning that we've done, and then for all of us together to explore what are the campaigning objectives and actions that we need to do in order to get that, secure that right to yeah. independent living. Yeah. Because that is the ultimate goal, but there's a lot of things we have to do to get to that point. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about like campaigning objectives, which really are kind of almost the, the rungs on the ladder to that goal of um, a, a real and meaningful legal right for us um, to, um, to independent living. So I'm going to spend about 10 minutes just going through some of the, the kind of campaigning options and, and ways of campaigning that, that we use and I know some of you use. And to be honest, Brian sum, summed it up so succinctly right at the beginning um, in his welcome, welcome um, opener. He talked about the Independent Living Fund doing a whole range of things, some lobbying, legal actions, direct action, media and solidarity. And I think, you know, they really are the things that I'm going to be echoing um, in the next few minutes. So, yeah, so just want to give an overview of, of different ways of campaigning and then we can have a discussion about how do we get to this, how do we help, how do we campaign to secure that right to independent living. And then hopefully we can come up with some specific objectives and actions that we can then share with the rest of the conference. So, right to it, independent living. So, just very briefly, um, I think we probably all know what we mean by independent living. It's definitely not what seems to be an increasing definition used amongst professionals and social workers is about doing things on your own. Our definition is having a right to have choice and control over your own life, to have equality of access and inclusion and to live the lives that we want to do. So it's a very, you know, it, 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 it encompasses everything. Article 19 of the UN Convention is a very handy um, kind of breakdown of, of um, our definition of independent living, but it's probably not very catchy, and I think maybe one of the things um, I personally think we probably have to get better at is coming up with a really compelling description of independent living that, you know, that we can say to Joe Bloggs on the street and they'll go, oh yeah, I get that now, and we probably haven't quite managed that, I think, um, particularly if, if you know, our concept can be kind of turned around and hollowed out. Um, I guess what we're also talking about when we're talking about a right to independent living is a legal right in domestic law that is enforced and meaningful. You know, we, we are experiencing more and more rights that, you know, we've got like the Equality Act but are, you know, not enforceable or not being enforced rather. We're not interested in that. We want a real meaningful um, legal domestic statutory right to independent living and I think as Mark said it, it this is about being free at the point of need this isn't about kind of dependent on where you are in the, in, in the country or I think there was a I think Mary Ellen you talked about the, the distinction between Hounslow and Hammersmith and the reason why there is such a massive difference is because in Hammersmith and Fulham we there was a group of activists got together and, and created huge change. And I'm going to tell, share a bit more about that um, um, in a few minutes' time. So it has to be free at the point of need wherever you are um, to get rid of that postcode lottery. Just finally as well, this is a brilliant time to, for us to be starting to really look at how we get independent living right on the agenda. 
we've got the UN concluding, UN Disability Committee concluding observations. The government are trying to ignore it, but you know, there is a pressure coming from the UN. They're clearly monitoring, particularly Article 19, and it's a real opportunity for us. We know social care has gone from like zero on the political agenda to nearly toppling the, um, the Conservative government in the general election. It was called the dementia tax. One of our challenges is to say this isn't just about older people, no. this is about disabled people oh. of, of all, all ages. Yeah. And also uh, mental health as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to say when I talk about disabled people, I, I include um, people with mental health issues or experience distress. But yeah, absolutely. And we also have um, the Labour Party and the Green Party signed up to enshrine the convention and um, and create a legal right to independent living. So we have got opportunities at the moment and, and we need to grasp them. So um, well, how can we get there? How, how can we get to that, that um, securing that right? Well, there is using the law, and we talked about that um, in the workshop before lunch. So that's about... Um, it's absolutely critical to, um, to campaigning is to understand the rights that we currently have, how they're being enforced or not enforced. So key ones are the Care Act, are the um, Human Rights Act, are the Equality Act. And we need to try and push them as far as possible to, to express through case law kind of what we mean by independent living. So I think Ellen mentioned that in the statutory guidance to the Care Act, they actually say well, the wellbeing principle, which is supposed to under, underpin all of the Care Act, is, is um, supposed to represent Article 19. Um, so we need to test that, and we need to test that through strategic litigation, um, and that's something that, that we are trying to do. So we've got to be... Con constantly pushing, um, using the law and our legal rights and our legal system to make the legislation that we have got more effective. We know that the Equality Act is, is failing um, us daily, you know, that the, the kind of lack of enforcement about around access to goods and services is, is, is really shocking. Um, we've got to keep We've got to keep um, using that act to turn it into something meaningful. We also need to know how to use our rights, as we talked about earlier. So we need better advocacy and advice. We need better resources that we can all use so that we can challenge poor practice and, um, and the kind of failure to uphold our rights in our own lives, but also we can support each other um, to do that. Oh, um, but how do we do that? Well, um, we need to, well, that's, uh, that's a question for us to, to answer. But, I mean, there are resources out there. There's our own experience, and we need to yeah. find ways of, of yeah. enabling us to support each yeah. other and share the information yeah. that we have got. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the guidance that came out of the, the Save the Independent Living Fund, we produced that frequently asked questions mm. guidance which we got a, a barrister to develop and that was really useful oh. and I think you know that that was shared but not wide enough we should every DDPO should be running workshops with local disabled people about their rights under the care act for example and, mm. and we need to, to do more to mm. make that happen um, and as I said we've got a um, shape case law and again, we do know that the Equality and Human Rights Commission is looking at how to um, strengthen independent living through legislation. So using the law is one key tool, but we also know that just the law on itself doesn't really do anything, and the success of the independent living campaign was the fact that it was part of a bigger, um, bigger piece of, of campaigning involving, as Brian said, lobbying, media, direct action. So it's we've got to use all the tools in the box, basically. Um, the other, as people have already talked about, is elections and lobbying. 
We need to, um, you know, we need to use elections. They are a very particular window when politicians want to come along and be seen to be listening. <laughs> and if, if we've clearly got some demands or asks, you can get politicians to sign up to those at election time. Mm. Um, and often they're not honoured, but it's a lever, and sometimes they are. So using um, elections is really important. And in London, we've got the local elections coming up in April. May. Um, oh, yeah, May, sorry. So we know, you know, that that's in London, we need to be doing a lot to mobilise around that. And uh, Operation Disabled Vote was set up a few years ago, and we want to be rolling that out again. Do you know, Tracy, there's a paradigm around the local council elections. There's a... It's a paradigm around the local council elections. Um, there must be in some way, but, you know, I think, it, I think it is in the sense that decisions are stopped and everybody goes into election mode. But, you know, that's when we need to be holding the hustings, inviting the candidates along and, and being really clear about demands. Um, so, you know, one of the tips that we'd recommend is write a manifesto. Mm. You know, clearly evidence what you need and, and, and just slap it on the table in front of the politicians and say, we want you to sign it. And often the nature of those things are that if one party signs it, the other parties won't want to be seen to not to sign it. And so you can, you know, you can use that competitive element between the political parties to get to get uh, as another lever to get uh, mm. buying and as i said um, organizing hustings taking part in other hustings asking those questions um, so that's around um, elections but obviously there's all of that ongoing lobbying as well so getting to know local councillors really building relationships up um, the same with mps inviting mps come and you know meet and build that relationship because most of them really don't have a clue about, you know, the lives that we lead, the issues that we're experiencing. Or if they do, it's in a very particular kind of way within their surgeries. And it's also, you know, there's devolution, so there's more opportunities to influence um, mayors. And I know there's DPOs in Manchester have been um, meeting with Andy Burnham there. So, um, and, and we are doing the same with Sadiq Khan, although we've yet to get a meeting with him. Um, so it's absolutely vital to use the democratic processes. And one of the unfortunate um, things of the last few years is that um, registered charities and DPOs are mostly registered charities, are getting increasingly nervous about getting involved in any kind of um, political um, campaigning because they fear that, you know, they their status as charities might be challenged. Um, you can't get into party political campaigning. You can't say our organisation supports the Labour Party or the Tory Party. But you can actually um, advocate and support particular policies if you can show that they, they link and, and, and are relevant to your organisation. So there's a lot of fear out there about campaigning in that kind of um, kind of election and lobbying way, but you can do it. Um, so how come you haven't had a meeting with Sadiq Khan? I mean, or... We had to, we had to use lots of contacts to get a meeting with him when he was standing for mayor, <laughs> and we managed that, but he then committed to meeting with DDPOs in London within his first 100 days, and it hasn't happened. How about the um, Assembly members, Labour and Greens or Tories? Well, we need to get better at using the assembly members as well. At the moment, you know, the our mayor in London is just continually doing statutory um, strategies at the moment, and it's like, come on, guys, it's nearly two years since you've been in in post. So I think there's a lot of frustration generally out in the voluntary sector in London. Um, would, would it be helpful? I mean, you've got to call into his press office to say why haven't you met? Well, you yeah, that might that, that that's a really good idea, John. Brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's definitely gone, hasn't it? It's definitely gone. I mean, we're, we're looking at you know, <laughs> 400 days, I think, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I actually add something yeah. on that? 
I happened to meet Sadiq Khan, who was sitting next to me getting my hair cut the other day. <laughs> and I managed to try and speak to him about um, disability, um, the International Day for Foods and Disabilities. He didn't even know what it was or know what was happening. Well, he promised me a call back from his office, which I have not yet heard back. And I'm an, I'm an active Labour Party member, so I'm not amused. Yeah. Well, we suggested last year that that would be the ideal opportunity to have that meeting, you know, yeah. to celebrate nothing, he's too busy. Um, so we've got, um, you know, I know this is being streamed, but we need to be thinking about what we do if there's continued kind of lack of engagement. Yeah. And at the moment, there's no other engagement happening. Um, so I'm going to suggest we take over County Hall for day. Well, for day. Mm. you said it, not me. <laughs> yeah. well, that City, wasn't my idea. I don't, know, I don't know any, you know, take over City Hall. I don't know if anybody else will be willing to be involved in a project. Well, I'm sure if you, I'm sure if you, yeah, there, there's people in this room definitely who yeah. will. Okay. Yeah, I, should put, we'll pick it I this. shall put something up on the DPAT site. Okay, good, oh, yeah. idea, great idea. So I don't know if you're aware of um, London Pride or Pride of London. Yeah. So uh, 